Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah. We are going through the minor prophets. They are called the minor prophets. And we are coming to the minor prophet Zechariah. Actually, as I've said before, these prophets are anything but minor. But they are called that because of the size of some of the letters. Uh, that's why they're called minor prophets. Two more minor prophets, Zechariah and then Malachi. And believe it or not, we will be finished with the Old Testament. Okay? I think the first time we went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it took us about 20 years. And I told you the second time, I think uh, I'd have to look, but I think it's been maybe close to five years, maybe less. Uh, and we are coming to a conclusion of the Old Testament in the next few weeks. And we have been in the New Testament as well, still have some more ground to cover there. But we are giving you an overview of the Bible instead of going down and trying to break it down verse by verse. And uh, there's a microscopic view you can do of Scripture, which is to break it down in detail. And then there is a telescopic view, which is a general overview of the Bible as a whole. So that's what we've done the second time around is an, a telescopic view, an overview of the Bible as a whole. So uh, I pray you've been blessed by the Word of God. We're in the prophet Zechariah today. So let's look at chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Amen. Amen. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, the Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice that term again and again, Lord of hosts. Okay. Be ye not as your fathers, unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I command in my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of? Your fathers. And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. And then upon the fourth and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sabbat, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, and then we have visions, and we'll talk about those, okay? All right, praise the Lord, let's pray. Father, we come before you right now, we ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy words. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all of the praise. We thank you, Lord, for your anointing that is upon it. Inspire us to preach it and to hear it and receive it and obey it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. All right. Go back over to Haggai very quickly. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. And we see the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month of the first day was when the word came to Haggai. Now we see in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, Chapter 1, verse 1 of Zechariah, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. So we put those two together, then you will see that Zechariah prophesied approximately two months after Haggai prophesied. So they're prophesying at the same time, and that is, number one, Haggai prophesied to get the people of God to build the temple of the Lord. Now remember, they've been back in their land. They laid the foundation of the temple. And for 15 years, the foundation was laid, but they did not build the temple of the Lord. They left the foundation and they quit working on the house of God for 15 long years. So God stirred up Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet to go and preach to them. Haggai comes, as I said last week, with fire in his eyes because they have neglected the work of God. They've neglected building the house of God. And so he comes with fire in his eyes. He's an, he's an older man than Zechariah. He gets the people working. He gets them 
to start building the temple of the Lord once again and uh, inspired them to do that. And a couple of months after he started his ministry, Zechariah comes preaching to the same people at the same time. Now, the people have been working on the house of God. Uh, Zechariah is a little bit different, though. Haggai comes with fire in his eyes, correcting the people because they are neglecting the house of God and building the house of God. Zechariah, coming at the same time, preaching at the same time, he comes more of a, a, an approach of encouragement. He, he looks and he sees that the people are already building the temple of God. And so what he does is he starts preaching them to encourage them to continue. He's a motivator. Okay. He's an encourager. He's a younger prophet than Haggai is. Haggai is an older prophet. Zechariah was born in the Babylonian captivity. So he's a younger prophet than Haggai. And he comes and he preaches, and he's preaching a message of encouragement. He's telling them better days are coming, so get busy. Keep, keep building the temple of God because better days are coming. So Haggai got the people working. Zechariah is motivating them to continue working on the house of God, telling them that better days are coming. So Zechariah was more of an encourager. Haggai was, was the older prophet. And uh, he is very strong, as I said, with fire coming out of his eyes. Now, both ministries were needed. Haggai had to come preach that the way he did because of the condition of the people. And he's got them going. He's got them working. So Zechariah comes, and he starts preaching because now the people are in a different condition. They're doing the work of God. They're building the temple. So he comes as an encourager, a motivator. Haggai is a practical prophet. Zechariah is a prophet of vision and prophecy. You need both. You need the practical prophet, the practical preacher, and you need the, the preacher uh, a visionary, uh, of visions and prophecy. And so Zechariah is a little bit different in his ministry than Haggai. But he's preaching to the same people. The only difference is that these people have started building the house of God like they were supposed to. Does everybody understand that? Okay. As far as the prophecy of Zechariah is concerned, chapter 1 uh, through chapter 8, there are the prophecies and visions of Zechariah, chapter 1 through chapter 8, the prophecies and visions of Zechariah. He receives a total of 10 visions in a 24 period of time, a 24 hour period of time, 10 visions. Now, some people only see eight visions, but we'll look at these visions, and you'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. If you include, include the carpenters and you include the branch, then you have ten visions instead of eight, and you'll see that because we're going to be covering them this morning and tonight, the ten visions that Zechariah saw in a 24-hour period of time. That is Zechariah chapter 1 through Zechariah chapter 8, okay? Now, Zechariah 7 and 8 is really on the back side of those ten visions. And what he sees in the uh, seventh and eighth chapter is questions and answers concerning fast days that Israel practiced and participated in relationship to the destruction of the temple. And that's the seventh and the eighth chapter. Then 9 through the remainder of the, of the book of Zechariah, 9 through 14, deals with the judgment upon the nations and the restoration of Israel in the future kingdom age. So let me go over that with you again. Chapter 1 through chapter 8, the visions and prophecies of Zechariah. Chapter 9 through 14 deal with the judgment upon the nations and the future glory of the nation of Israel. Amen. This man is an amazing prophet. If you're going to understand the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, you must understand the book of Zechariah. Some people say that the book of Daniel is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. I believe personally that the book of Zechariah is the Old Testament book uh, that you must understand in order to understand the book of Revelation. 
In order to understand the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, you must understand the book of Zechariah. That's why this is so important for you to get a hold of. A lot of people are interested in the book of Revelation these days, the end time events. If you understand the book of Zechariah, then you can understand the book of Revelation. Because Zechariah is written in the same way that the book of Revelation is written. It is called apocalyptic writing. Now what apocalyptic writing means, apocalypse, or which we get the word revelation from, means to unveil or to uncover. Uh, apocalyptic writing is a writing that is, is very unique. It uncovers, it unveils, it shows you the future. It teaches you things about the future. Zechariah is going to teach you about the future. Apocalyptic writing, even though it is uh, means to unveil or to uncover, it is written in signs and symbols. It will have angelic movement within the writings and the visions. There will be angels there. Signs and symbols and angelic hosts and all kinds of visions and things like that will be going on in apocalyptic writing. So again, it means to unveil. It's written in symbolic language. Uh, angels are in the, in the pictures and visions are in apocalyptic writings. And so Zechariah is a book of apocalypse. It is what we understand the book of Revelation to be in the New Testament. Same type of writing is the book of Revelation. In fact, in fact the word Revelation comes from the word apocalypsis or apocalypse. Okay? So that's his style. He's a very interesting prophet, especially when you get into visions and you look at him and you see what he's saying about the future. It will teach you a lot. Now, Zechariah comes on the scene, as we've said. Notice that the Bible says the eighth month and the second year of Darius. Notice again that the dating of the prophecy is given by a Gentile ruler, not a Jewish king. Now, Haggai is the same, same way. We've already looked at that. Darius uh, is mentioned there. He is a Medo-Persian king. Now, Medo-Persia, uh, when you talk about Medo-Persia in the Bible, you had Babylon conquer, and after Babylon, Medo-Persian conquered Babylon. And then Greece conquered the Medes and the Persians, and Rome conquered Greece. When you talk about Medo-Persian, Medo-Persia, you're talking about modern-day Iran. Okay? So that's very important to understand. So this man, Darius, then was a Gentile ruler that is dated, dating the books here. And the reason is because now we're under what is called in the New Testament the times of the Gentiles, which means that Israel is under the foot of Gentile power and authority. You would you understand that term, times of the Gentiles. So that's why these prophecies here, post-exilic prophet number two, Haggai was the first post-exilic prophet, Zechariah the second, Malachi the third. That means these prophets prophesied after the exile or captivity, and they're dated by uh, Gentile kings because that shows you that Israel is under Gentile dominion at this time. So that's the difference in these prophets. They are post-trauma prophets. They are post-exile prophets. They are preaching to people who've gone back home and are building the temple of God and putting things in proper place, spiritually speaking. So Haggai preaches and Zechariah preaches at the same time. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so let's see what the Bible says here. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. The son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet saying. Now this is interesting here. Zechariah means the Lord remembers. He's the son of Berechiah, which means the Lord comforts. And uh, Berechiah is the son of Iddo, which means the time appointed. So all of these names are symbolic. So we see Zechariah, when he comes, he is an encourager. He's a comforter to the people. He's telling them better days are coming, so get busy serving God. Now, if you know better days are coming, you, you, that'll cause you to get busy serving God. If you don't think better days are coming, you don't really, you don't just, what's the use, right? Forget it. But when you know better days are coming, it'll encourage you to get busy serving God. And so Zechariah, the, the Lord remembers, the son of Berechiah, the Lord comforts. 
the son of Iddo, the appointed time. Verse 2, what does the Lord say? The Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. Now what a way to start a message. God is not happy with your fathers. Now why was God not happy with the fathers of this people? Well, the Bible says in verse 3, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, very important term, 52 times in the book of Zechariah, the Lord of hosts is used, the Lord of hosts, which means he is the creator of the angelic host, and he is the one who is in charge of them. He's the one that's, that leads them. Amen? Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. So this verse 3 is the key verse in the book of Zechariah. Everybody with me here? The key verse. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now that's interesting. God says if we turn to Him, He'll turn to us. We're living in a day right now where people want God to turn to them without them turning to God. See, they, they want to put it on God. They want to point the finger at God. Say, God, we want you to come and help us. We want you to come and save us. But if you don't turn to God, the Bible says He has no reason to turn to you. You with me here? That's the mentality of people today. They, they, they put, it on, put it all on God. But God says if you turn to Him, then He, then he will turn to you. Right? Praise the Lord. See, God will save you. God will heal you. God will deliver you. God will fill you with His Spirit. God will save you. But once He does that, once He sets you free, you have a responsibility as an individual to get rid of the things out of your life that you should get rid of. You look in the New Testament, the Bible talks about Lazarus. He came out of the grave. Jesus spoke to that grave, spoke to Lazarus, said, Lazarus, come forth. Remember, Lazarus came walking out of the grave. And what did Jesus say to those that were standing by? He said, loose him. Well, so that's what they did. They loosed his hands and they loosed his feet, but they didn't take the grave clothes off. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before or not. In the New Testament, they did not take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. Lazarus went home wearing his grave clothes. And when Lazarus got home, Lazarus had to take the grave clothes off and set them aside. So what God will do is He will speak to ministry. He will speak to the people of God. He will speak to you through His Word. And He will set you free. He'll break the chains, so to speak. He'll, the things that are binding you. He'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. He'll, he'll save you. He'll deliver you and set you free. But you have a responsibility after God sets you free to get rid of your own grave clothes. That's not my responsibility. That's your responsibility. When you go home after God saves you, after God delivers you, then you've got to get rid of the stuff out of your life that shouldn't be in your life. That old, those old grave clothes that the addictions you used to have. Amen. God's, brother and sister, I don't want to offend anybody here today, but God's not going to take cigarettes away from you. He's not going to do it. He's not going to take alcohol away from you. He's not going to take those things. You say, oh God, would you please take... God don't smoke. You with me here today? God doesn't smoke, so He's not going to take them away from you. You're the one that got to take those grave clothes off. You're the one that has to take those cigarettes and throw them in the trash. And then you know, ask God to help help you overcome that. He will help you overcome that. But you're the one that still got you can't. God's not going to take your cigarettes away because He doesn't smoke. He's not going to take drinking away from you either because he don't drink. I know you don't like this. I mean, you want it to be all on God. You want God to do it all. You want somebody else to be responsible for your life. But God is calling, calling us to be responsible for our own grave clothes. Amen. 
See, we want to put it all on God and we want to put it all on the church, you know, and point the finger at God and point the finger at the church why, you know, we, we don't, we're not getting the help we need and all that kind of craziness. But God came to set us free. God came to save you. God came to deliver you. God came to heal you, fill you with the Holy Ghost and power. But you got to make up your mind to throw the cigarettes in the trash, to go to your refrigerator and, and open the door and get rid of the alcohol out of that and go to the bar and get rid of the whiskey out of there because God's not going to go over there and get it out of there for you. I know you don't like it and I don't care. Amen. You you're gonna be you're gonna be the, you gotta go and you gotta you gotta get the Playboy magazines out of, out from underneath your bed, out from underneath your own mattress. God's not gonna go and get that Playboy magazine out from underneath your mattress. You're gonna have to go get that and throw that away. Say praise the Lord. Our mama's gonna find it and she'll throw it away for you. But God don't do that. So whatever your, your situation is, you know, whatever your battle is, whatever your addiction is, whatever your problem is, whatever your trouble is, you have to get rid of those. You have to take the grave clothes off and put them aside and stop blaming everybody else, blaming mama, blaming dad, blaming the church, blaming God. No, no, God, God has done his part. How many of y'all believe God did his part? God did his part. Amen. And you, you and I need God. We depend on God. But you're going to have to get rid of your own grave clothes. God will set you free. He told the people standing by Lazarus, he said, loose them and let them go. But he, they didn't take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. He walked home that day with his grave clothes and he had to take them off. Say praise the Lord. Now, I, see, what we want to do is we want to make God, we, we're, we're all about cop out. We want to put it all on God. God, come and take away my drugs, take away my smoking, take away my sex addiction, take away my alcohol problem, take away, this, take away my cussing, take away my lying, take away, take, take, take away from me being a thief. No, he don't do that because he doesn't, he doesn't participate in any of that. So you're going to have to get rid of that yourself. Say praise the Lord. Now I know you don't like it, but I don't care. I'm going to tell you the truth. Praise the Lord. He's not going to clean your house. You're going to have to clean your house for yourself. He's not going to mow your yard. You're going to have to mow your yard for yourself. Amen. I know you want him to make a living for you, but he's not going to make a living for you. You're going to have to go out there and make a living for yourself. I know you want him to build a house for you to live in, but he doesn't build a house for you to live in. You're going to have to go find one for yourself. And I know you don't like it, but I don't care. <laughs> I do love you. And I'll tell you the truth. See, we're living in, we're, especially in America, we, people have a sense of entitlement. You know, that's what the political situation we're in right now is all about. Man, this, you know, we got one group. It's all about giving everybody whatever they want. Well, somebody's going to pay for that. You might not, but somebody else is going to. Do you think God's going to? No, you have a responsibility, amen, to change your life, to be a responsible individual to get rid of the addictions in your life. And you've been praying, say, oh God, will you deliver me from this? And you take this away from me. I'll, I'll be so thankful. And God said, what are you talking about? I called you to repent. You can change if you want to. Right? You with me? One thing I can tell you, one thing I have learned, you know, in some of the courses I've been taking is that any, everybody that points a finger at somebody else never change. It's not until you get to a place in your life where you're grown up enough to say, I'm going to stop pointing a finger at somebody else and I'm going to stop blaming somebody else and you say, I've got a problem. 
And when you, when you, instead of getting upset and getting mad when somebody's trying to help you and tell you the truth, at some point, look at your life and the mess that you've made of it and stop blaming everybody else and say, I need to change. And when you and I get to that place, and I said, me too, okay, you'll change. As long as you're blaming somebody else for where you are, you'll never change. You blame the church, blame God, blame mama, blame daddy, blame everybody. Blame the person on the street corner and he don't even know you. You'll never change, man. You got, you got to own it. You got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I got some grave clothes. I'm looking, and I'm not just looking from here up. I got a full length mirror and this is a full length mirror right here, the word of God. And I'm tired of blaming everybody else for work. the situation I got myself in. And I really, I really do appreciate everything you've done. You know, and I'm, I'm speaking in the sense that, uh, you know, where you are and where I am. If somebody help you, you need to appreciate that they helped you. Because they don't have to. Let me say it again. They don't have to. Brother Dice used to teach me, man. And, you know, I get to blame him. I get to blame him for all my bad, bad faults. Not really. <laughs> He's with the Lord right now. Amen. But he would, he would always say, you know, somebody takes an interest in you and tries to help you. He said, always remember, they didn't have to do that. And you need to show your appreciation for what God has done and what other people have done for you and act like a grown up adult and be responsible with your life. Hallelujah. Stop blaming everybody else. It doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere doing that. But I do thank God for all the help that I've received along the way. Because they didn't have to do it. So we need to be more thankful, more appreciative in our life for what God does and what other people do. Because, you know, ultimately it's on us to make the changes that we need to make. Say praise the Lord. And I, and I know you don't like it, but I don't care. No, I love you. <laughs> but that's the truth. You have to own it. You have to say, I'm tired of living like I've been living. Yes, Praise the Lord. You can go through life trying to help everybody under the sun. And if they don't appreciate it, you're wasting your time. And if they're not willing to change, let me just tell you, let me help you, you're wasting your time. If they don't see that they have the problem. Are you awake? I said, are you awake? If they're hell-bent on going to jail, they're going to go to jail no matter what you do. And I know you don't like it, but I don't care. <laughs> That's just the way it is. You know, you say, man, you're you're callous, preacher. No, I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth today. Until somebody recognizes that i got to turn to God. When I turn to God, He'll turn to me. When I repent, when I get ready to make a change then God will help me. He'll help me make the change. But ultimately, i got to be the one to throw that stuff in the trash and change my life and become what I should become because God has got a great plan for you. He's got a great purpose. You're not here by accident. I don't care how you came through the matrix and, and what brought you here on this planet, but I'm going to tell you today, you're not here by accident. God's got a great plan for your life. Better days are ahead. I said better days are ahead. That's what Zechariah will tell him. Better days are ahead, but you got to turn to God, and then he'll turn to you. Don't always put it on God. Say, God, you turn to me. No, God, say, you turn to me, then I'll turn to you. Pray, you got a responsibility, brother and sister. Hallelujah. Key verse in the book of Zechariah. He goes on and he says, Be ye not as your fathers. Oh, wow. Don't be like them. He said, I sent prophets to them, you know. And those prophets preached to them and, and the fathers never got a hold of it. They never would change. He said, don't be like them. Don't blame. No, you can't blame them. God's not saying you got a, you got a, an escape goat here. You can blame your parents. He didn't say that. He said, don't be like them. He said, I sent prophets to your fathers. I sent prophets and they wouldn't listen. 
I sent prophets. The prophets spoke the word of God to them and they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't get a hold of it. They refused to change. They refused to turn to God. And God said to this generation, He said, don't be like them. Amen. It's important to understand that you'll never find a young person in the house of you got let's say you got a mother and a father that go to church. And they go to church and they go to church and they go to church. But if that mother and father, if both of them, they go to church, but they're not dedicated to God. You will never raise a dedicated young person if you and your husband or you and your wife are not dedicated to God. It's impossible because those young people will look at your life and they see the way you live and you're not dedicated to God. They know you're a hypocrite. And so what they, that there's just no way that you can find dedication in a young person if the mother and the father go to church but they're not dedicated to God. You'll never find a dedicated young person in a situation like that. You'll find that you can find from time to time a dedicated young person that comes out of the sinner's home. You know what I mean by a sinner's home? I mean people that don't go to church. They don't live for God. But say young person comes to church and they get filled with the Holy Ghost and they get baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, that person, that young person, I've seen young person, young people come to God, amen, out of the sinner's home and become dedicated to God. Amen. You with me here today? So it is possible for a, a young person to come out of the sinner's home and be dedicated to God. But if a mother and a father are in a church and they're not dedicated to God, you'll never raise a dedicated young person. Now you can have one uh, of those parents that are dedicated to God. And that young person will be dedicated to God. You with me? A wife, let's say you got a wife in a church, she's dedicated to God. But the husband goes to church but not dedicated to God. Then... One dedicated parent can produce a dedicated young person. You say you got a husband that goes to church, but the wife, now she goes to church too, but the husband's dedicated and the wife's not. You can have a dedicated young person out of that. But you will never have a dedicated young person if you've got both parents in the church not dedicated to God. You understand what I'm telling you? So the Bible tells us we have a situation here where the parents, God comes and speaks to the parents, particularly the fathers. And He's telling, telling this young generation, He says, you don't be like them. He said, I sent prophets to them. And those prophets preached my word to them, but those fathers, those parents, you can put it that way, did not appreciate those prophets. Now, the thing about prophets is that prophets are needed, but prophets are not wanted. Prophets are, are needed, but they're not wanted. A true prophet of God, you'll find nobody wants them. Or very few people want them. Prophets are needed, but they're not wanted. In fact, this very prophet, Zechariah, right here, they killed him. with the awesome message that he brought of encouragement of better days to come, they still killed him between the porch and the altar. You say, well, if he'd have come with a different message, well, what kind of message would he have brought? He brought a message of a better day coming. He brought a message of encouragement. They still killed him. Why? Because their hearts weren't right. And no doubt that's one of the reasons why the judgment would fall upon that on that generation. It's because they slew the prophet between the, the porch and the altar. The awesome man of God. You see, the problem is God sent prophets, but prophets are needed, but they're not wanted by the people. And the thing about prophets when they preach is that if they're 
really sent by God, and they preach what God tells them to do, the people kill them. If they don't preach what God tells them to preach, God kills them. So either way, if you're a prophet, Melvis, you're going to die. I'm not sure about that. We're going to pray over you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Right? See, I don't claim to be a prophet. I'm going to put it on her. Hallelujah. Amen. So the prophet, prophet to, to Zambia, you know. But that's the way it is. Prophets are needed, but they're not wanted. And normally end up dead. And after they're dead, then everybody goes to their funeral. Everybody goes to their sepulchers and, and puts flowers there. Like they, you know, and Jesus said, you're a hypocrite. You go over there and you garnish the, the tombs of the prophets. You celebrate the prophet's life. And you killed them. You're a hypocrite. Prophets are needed, but prophets are not wanted. And so this man comes and he prophesies and he's telling them, don't be like your fathers. The prophets were sent to them and they didn't get a hold of the word that the prophets preached. Are you with me today? I mean, you think about how much God loved these people. This prophet was sent to his people. God loved them. The reason why God sends prophets to you, preachers to you, is because he loves you. They, they, they would not listen to those prophets. They did not appreciate they, those prophets. And Jesus said again in the New Testament, a prophet is not without honor except in his own house. A prophet can go somewhere else and be honored and appreciated, but a prophet is not honored in his own house. That's what Jesus said. So Zechariah comes and he prophesies and he preaches without honor. Because he's preaching to his own people. He's a Jewish prophet preaching to Jewish people. I don't know if you know this, but every time in the, in the Bible that a Gentile had a dream or a vision, that dream or that vision had to imper be interpreted by a Jew. Nebuchadnezzar had a, a dream or vision in uh, Daniel chapter 2 of this great image, head of gold, you know the story, big old tall image. He didn't know what it meant. Daniel, a Jew, had to interpret it. You with me here today? So God will give visions and dreams to Gentiles and sometimes pagans. But it's going to take a servant of God to interpret it. And particularly in the Old Testament, a Jew. Even in the New Testament, you see that principle played out as well. So this is the Jewish prophet preaching to his own people, the Jews. And he's telling them from God, your daddy's never listened to me. He said, I sent the prophets to them and they just wouldn't get a hold of the message. They didn't believe it, you know. And no doubt because they didn't receive the message, didn't get a hold of the message, no doubt they came up with excuses like, well, I don't believe he's a true prophet or she's a true prophet or whatever. But think about it. Jeremiah preached to these people and they threw him in a pit. God told Jeremiah, when he, before he ever started preaching, he told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, they're not going to listen to anything you're saying. Can you imagine a prophet being raised up by God? He's going to preach for 40 years and God tells him you're not going to have one convert. And so this is what God's talking about. You did, verse 4, but you be not like your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. They didn't take it to heart. They heard it with their minds. They heard it with their heads. But they didn't take it to heart. They didn't get a hold of it. Isn't that sad? I, I say that's sad. It's sad, isn't it? That these people would not listen to the prophets that God sent. Brothers and sisters, we're not too far away from the book of Malachi. When we get through preaching Zechariah, then we'll be in Malachi and preach that. But in between Malachi and Matthew, there's 400 silent years where there is no prophet recorded. Doesn't mean there weren't any. 
but there's no written prophecy from a prophet of God for 400 silent years. God said you wouldn't listen to him when I sent him to you. So there's going to be 400 years between Malachi and Matthew where we have no inspired scripture written by a prophet. So basically what God said, you got what you wanted. You got what you wanted. Unappreciated. Without honor. But God sent him trying to reach him. So he starts right out. He says, you're going to have to turn back to God. And God will turn to you if you do. He said, don't be like your fathers. Amen. They wouldn't listen to the prophets. God is good. He's a good God. The problem wasn't with God. The prophet wasn't with the prophet. The problem wasn't with the prophets. The problem with the people. Now, I'll just bring it to your attention. Again, this man, Zechariah, you know, I could, I could sort of see where maybe somebody want to take Haggai and kill him. Because that man's coming with fire in his eyes, man. He's getting on their case. But Zechariah, man, he's an encourager. And yes, he has to bring a warning at the beginning of his message. A warning is there in his message, but he was an encourager. And they took that man and killed this man. Shows you the condition of the hearts of people, brother. And after they kill them, then they go and put flowers at the tombs and act like they're, you know, no, just hypocrites. So that's what God has to deal with. He's starting out with Zechariah giving them a warning about their attitude. Encouraging them not to go down that road. Say, praise the Lord. Verse uh, 5. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Of course, the answer is no. Father, yeah, you're, they're gone too. Prophets are gone. Die. You got a prophet here, Zechariah and Haggai preaching to you. Will you listen to them? Or not? Verse 6. But my words and my statutes which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold? Of your fathers. Just wouldn't get a hold of it, you know? That always ever heard that statement. <laughs> you gotta get that cat by the whiskers. They just never would get this cat by the whiskers. You know, they just never would get a hold of it. Hallelujah. Just like a lot of people in Odessa, Texas, Bible Center Fellowship. Well, most of y'all today, y'all get up. Y'all got this cat by the whiskers, most of you. All right, but I've been here almost 25 years, and there's some just never got that cat by the whiskers. <laughs> they never got a hold of it. But it's the prophet's fault. It's God's fault. No, God said, it's your fault. Amen. How many of y'all want to change? Then you got to say, I got the problem. God's trying to help me. God's trying to help you. In the Holy Ghost today, I ask you a question. And this is for only one person. Right now, what I'm about to say, and you, you have to determine whether it means you or not, but how many churches are you going to go to until you find one that God's talking to you instead of you trying to find one that you want? You run from one church to another church to another church because you're looking for somebody to say what you want to hear. How long are you going to do that? When God speaks to you, sometimes you don't feel good about it. But it'll save you because the Word of God is what saves you. Some of you say, well, I want, to, I want to go where the love of God is. The love of God don't save you. Oh, I'm shocked. No, the love of God don't save you. The love of God is what motivated Jesus Christ to go to the cross and die for us. But the love of God don't save you. There's people in hell today that God loves. The love of God don't save you. The Word of God saves you. You need to go to, that, to a church that God sends you to and plant you and put you there. And stay there. No matter what you go through. To hear the Word of God. Amen. Say praise the Lord. 
I sure am thankful today the Lord spoke to me to only go to the, through the first chapter. <laughs> I thought about going through all ten visions this morning, Brother Patrick, but I felt like the Lord said, well, you're eating lunch today. <laughs> so I'm only going to cover three visions. And that's all in the first chapter. Verse 7. No, I'll go to verse 6 again. But my words and my statutes which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? And they returned and said, Like as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us according to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. See, they're putting it on God again. You know? We say, well, you know, because God said this is going to happen to us, we just decided to go that direction. Are you kidding me? God came and warned you not to go that direction. That that was in you to do this. And you said because somebody came and prophesied what was in you to do. Now you're going to say, I'm just going to do it now because they said I was going to. That's what these people were saying. They want to blame God. Been down that road before. If it's not you, if that prophecy is not you, then prove it. If that prophecy is you, you will prove it. If you don't repent. Mm -hmm. I hear, mm hmm. Y'all ever see Diamond and Silk on Fox? Y'all ever see those two Diamond and Silk? You know, you got one, she's the commentator, she's the talking one, and the other one's over there, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. That every once in a while she'll she'll instead of saying mm-hmm, she'll say that's right, that's right. Well, I I got him, I got one of them right. I think this is I don't know which one's diamond and silver, but he's the one that goes mm-hmm, that's right. And I just laugh, man. Praise the Lord. If God brings a word to you, a prophetic word to you, it's not so you say what well, you told me. Well, that's what I need to do then. No, so you don't do that. It's a warning from God, man. So don't use that as an excuse for committing the very thing that God warned you about. Yeah. Amen. And I went to church, man. They made me feel like a dog. Made me feel bad. So I guess I am. So I'm just going to go out there and go to hell with everybody else. No, you went to church today so you could hear about how bad you are. So you need a Savior. You need God's Word. The love of God. But the love of God doesn't save you. The love of God is what motivates you to die on the cross for us. The Word of God is what saves us. The Word of God. So you have Christocentric believers, which means they believe they have an experience with God. And their experience is just as good as anybody else's experience. That's a Christocentric believer. Bibliocentric believer. Their experience lines up with the Word of God. If your experience doesn't line up with the Word of God, you're lost. If you're a bibliocentric believer, your experience lines up with the Word of God and you'll be saved. The love of God don't save you. It's the... Word of God that saves you. Hear it and obey it. Praise the Lord. Are y'all awake? Are y'all all right? We getting close to lunch. I want to go to church where they have the love of God. Well, praise the Lord. You go to a church that has the Word of God. You go to a church that has the love of God. It might not be your flavor. But that's the truth. Look at your neighbor and tell him, God bless your heart. Yeah, God bless your heart. So the Bible tells us he has the first vision. 24 hour period of time, man. You talk about having visions. You know, now, Prophetess Melva, she has all the visions. I'm a practical preacher. I hardly ever have a vision. You know, I'd sort of like to be like her, have a direct line to heaven. 
You know what I mean? Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be really cool. Wake up, angels standing at your foot of your bed. and You know what I'm saying? Man, I could pray, God, would you send an angel to stand at the foot of my bed and they never, they never show up? And they, might not, they might be there. I've been told they're there. But I don't know if they are. But she gets up and every morning there's an angel at the foot of her bed, just about. You know. Well, I'd love to be that kind of preacher, but I'm a practical preacher. She'll tell you I'm a practical preacher. I talk dollars and cents, don't I? And then she's over here, well, I had a vision, you know. I said, good, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I don't think you had ten visions in one night, have you? And I'm not making light of it. This is reality. But have you ever had ten visions in one night, 24-hour period? And you're not going to be sleeping much. How many, what's the most you think you've ever had, sister, in 24 hours? Lord, talking to you. I'll let you count and I'll get back with you. <laughs> but this guy had, um, had 10 visions in one 24 hour period of time, man. God was, whoo, see? Now, Haggai didn't have that, did he? He didn't have that. No. This is an apocalyptic prophet. Signs and visions. End time, an end time prophet. Praise the Lord. So he has the first vision. Here it is. In the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Sabbat, that's probably January, February. And the second year of Darius, so we're still in the same year, uh, we're about three months later, he has the first vision. And the Bible says, uh, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord and Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, judgment, night speaks of judgment. Amen. Now, I, pr I can preach the visions of the Lord. don't have a lot of visions from God. God's called me to preach this Word. You understand? That's my ministry, to preach this Word. That's This is it right here. And this Word is, has more authority than any vision. If a vision doesn't line up with the Word of God, the vision is, is not correct. I'm called to preach this Word. It's infallible. You with me here today? So I can preach the visions of the Lord. And when you preach Him, you got to have, you have to interpret Him, but you have to interpret Him by the Word of God. And the Word of God, night speaks of judgment. And so he gets this first vision, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. And he keeps watching this man rides on a red horse. The Bible said he stood among the myrtle trees. Now the Bible goes on to tell us who is this a uh, rider on the horse. It's the Lord of hosts. Amen. Verse 7, 11. And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. So this rider on this horse is none other than the angel of the Lord. This is a theophany. That means it's, it's God who's come in human form. God, it, God, this is it. Listen, listen, please, please listen. This is not the pre-incarnate Christ. You with me? This is a theophany. It is a visible manifestation of God in human form. And so Zacharias sees this, this, uh, the angel of the Lord, a manifestation of God, riding on this red horse. And he keeps looking, and he says that the location is among the myrtle trees. Down, down in the valley. Okay. Now, first of all, the rider is the Lord Himself. This horse that He's riding, obviously, is a spiritual, a spirit horse. Okay, it's not a physical horse; it's a spirit horse. And I wish I had uh, the pictures I could show you. I have all kinds of pictures on Zechariah, but I don't have anybody in the back to do this. And I could show you these pictures. So this Lord, the Lord is riding visible form of a man on this horse and 
He goes among the myrtle trees. Now the myrtle trees, there's a symbolic language. It's apocalyptic writing. Okay? He's riding on a red horse which speaks of the blood of Jesus Christ that would be shed for us. Red also speaks of war. And he rides that horse among the myrtle trees in this, in this valley, in this low place. The myrtle trees represent the people of God. And so the Lord is seen here in the midst of the people of God. He's showing them that He is their life. Like we preach Wednesday night, the God who is life. He's in the midst of them. He's their life. Now, brothers and sisters, at this point in their history, in their life, they're not doing too good. They've been through a lot, this people. And the reason why they've been through a lot is because they haven't been serving God right. And they haven't been building the house of God. So they've been through a lot. Haggai already showed that to us. We looked at that last week. But here, brothers and sisters, I want you to see this. Even though the people of God had not been what they were supposed to be, God said, I'm still in the midst of you. The living God is still in the midst of you. I told you, man, you talk about a, a prophet with encouraging words, better days to come. He's preaching to a people that do not deserve to have the presence of God in their midst. They've just come out of captivity. They've been back in their land about 15 years. And they've gone through a lot because they stopped building the house of God. And now they're building the house of God again. And Zechariah is a motivating prophet. He's encouraging them to keep building. And now he sees this vision from God. The Lord is with you in the midst of the myrtle trees. You don't deserve His presence. I don't either. But this encourages me today that even when I don't deserve His presence, God is still with me. The life of God inside of me. Inside of you. Inside of the church. By the blood of Jesus Christ. These myrtle trees speak of the nation of Israel. Myrtle trees are very, very rare. They grow, some grow in Israel. I've heard some grow in Oregon. It's it's very rare to find a myrtle tree. So number one, God is saying to this people that He's dwelling in the midst of, and they don't deserve it. He's letting them know you're like the myrtle tree. You're rare. And, you're, and the myrtle tree is very fragrant. There's a beautiful aroma, God says, that's coming from my people. Because now they're serving me the way they're supposed to serve me. They're building the house of God the way they're supposed to build the house of God. So there's a beautiful aroma that's coming from the myrtle trees. This rare people. There's no nation on the earth like the nation of Israel. There's no nation on the earth like the church. And God says, you're putting off a beautiful aroma. Those myrtle trees are evergreen trees. And so God is showing them that they are a rare people, that they are a fragrant people, and that God is in the midst of them, even though they've done horrible things in the past. God is not done with them. By His grace and by His mercy, He's there with them. And when you know that, brothers and sisters, see, the enemy will come at times and tell you that God, He's forgotten you. He, he don't even know you're alive. He doesn't care about you. And you've been through so much in life. And obviously, as the prophets have showed, they brought it on themselves. But you can get into a place where you'll start having a distorted view of God. And you think that God doesn't know where you are, that God doesn't care about you, that God doesn't see you because of all you've gone through. But God says, I'm still in the midst of my people. I'm there and they're putting off a beautiful fragrance and you ought to be thankful today for the presence of God in your life when you didn't deserve it. And just how rare in this passage Israel is and how rare the church of Jesus Christ. You are rare, brothers and sisters, in this earth. Not everybody is in covenant relationship with God Almighty. Not everybody is saved by the blood. Nobody's ever, not everybody's filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name, a part of the covenant community of God. 
You are a rare, unique people. There's nothing greater on the earth than the church of Jesus Christ. And even though we are not what we are supposed to be, he said, I'm still in the midst of you. And if you know that God is with you, what better encouragement is that than that? If I know God is still with me and I know there's better days to come, I'm going to get busy serving God. If I don't believe that God loves me, if I don't believe that God is still with me, and if I don't believe better days are coming, what's the use? But God is coming and speaking through this prophet to a people that don't deserve the presence of God like so many of us. And he says, God is still with you because you're in covenant with him. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, God is with you. And you're rare, a rare people on this earth. And God wants the best for you. God loves you. He doesn't want you under the heels of any enemy. He wants you victorious. He wants you thriving. He wants you blessed in the earth. See, they got them, them, themselves in the situations and the problem that they're in. The judgments came on them because of their life. But God wants the best for you. He doesn't want to judge us. He doesn't, come on somebody. He doesn't want us to be under the heel of some enemy. He wants the best for you. And he's with you and he's with me even when we don't deserve it, praise the Lord. And so there he is amongst the myrtle trees. And then all of a sudden the prophet sees these other riders. And the Bible tells us about these riders. Behind him were red horses speckled and white. And so the prophet says, Lord, what are these? Then the Lord interprets this. He said, the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And they answered the angel, the Lord, that, that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sit is still and is at rest. The prophet says, What are these horses? See, this prophet communicates, Amen, with the Lord. He sees these other horses riding, the red horses, speckled white horses. What are these horses? And God says, well, these horses are the ones that go throughout the earth. What are they? They are the scouts. The Lord's scouts. You know what a scout is, right? Somebody that goes and checks things out. and They are the Lord's scouts. And they're moving throughout the earth right now. And they're seeing, they're watching. And God knows everything, but this is symbolic language. They're seeing what's going on in relationship to the other Gentile nations. What about Babylon? What about Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, which they're in this, gener in, the, in this history at this time. What about Greece to come? What about Rome? These powers that have God's people under their heel. What about them? And so the angel scouts go out. These, these spirit riders on spirit horses go out and they see what's going on and they come back and they report to the Lord what's going on and they made this statement to the Lord. And he said, what we saw is that people are at ease. Behold, all the earth sit is still and is at rest. What's Assyria doing? What's Babylon doing? What are these nations doing? Well, they're not helping Israel. They're not helping Israel. They're at rest. They're focused on their own things. They're not, they're not helping Israel. Are y'all with me here? And not only were they not helping Israel at this time, but these powers like Assyria and Babylon that were used by God to judge His people because of their sin. They went too far. They shouldn't have gone as far and mistreated the people of God like they did. God told them to go and, and do these things to take them captive. But they mistreated the people of God. They went too far. And God said, I saw all of that. And now He said, I see the nations. They're at rest. They're not helping you. 
And not only that, but I can, God says, I look at their history and I see how they mistreated you. But God says, I'm with you. I'm with you. When people mistreat you, I'm with you. I want the best for you. I've used other, other nations to discipline you. And in your case, maybe God used situations and individuals to discipline you. If you belong to Him, He will do that. He'll use the world to discipline you. But the world will go too far. God used these nations to scatter Israel to bring them back to Him. He used the captivity to bring them back to Him. Now they're in the land. They've been there about uh, 15 years or so. And things haven't been going good until they started serving God. But God says the nations around you are at rest, but I'm busy helping you. Verse 12, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the city of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and seventy years, that seventy year captivity? And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me, angels communicate with the prophet. The angel communed with me and said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. And I am very displeased with the heathen that were at ease. See, I told you that it was the nations that were at ease. For I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction. God said, I was a little displeased with you, but they went too far in afflicting my people. He said, I see these nations, they're not helping you. They went too far in afflicting you, but God said, I was just a little displeased. He. You'll see in the third chapter of Zechariah, Satan is standing there over against the, the high priest Joshua, the son of Josedek. And that high priest has got filthy garments on. And Satan is there pointing a finger at the high priest, the filthy garments on that priest. That priest represents the nation. And Satan was saying, these people don't deserve your mercy. They're so filthy and they're so unclean. And he was bringing accusation against them and we'll see it tonight, God willing. God says, you know, if you look at that and we'll look at it tonight, God willing, do you know God doesn't even answer the devil when the devil brought up the filthiness of the high priest? You know what God did? He said, put clean clothes on him. See, the devil was saying, they deserve to die. They, they don't deserve your help. They, do, they, do, they deserve your judgment, God, because look how filthy they are. And God doesn't even answer the devil concerning the filthiness of that people. He just says, put new clean clothes on them. Somebody said, praise the Lord. The enemy comes as an accuser of the brethren to accuse you before God day and night. And yes, there are things in our life. But I, you know, if I look at the passage correctly, God doesn't even answer the accusations of Satan. He just said, put clean garments on them. Hallelujah to the Lamb. See, Satan wanted to make them feel like it was over. He wanted to accuse these people before God to the point where, you know, God, you shouldn't be helping them. Look how unclean. I said, I've got the answer. I'm going to put clean garments on them. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God says, I was but just a little displeased. You, you want them to, to feel like they're totally done for. <clears throat> the accuser of the brethren comes to you day and night. And there are times when God is not pleased with you and He's not pleased with me, but that doesn't mean He's done with me. He doesn't say away with you. I don't want anything to do with you. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord God. Or they went too far in their afflicting of the people. They deserved what they got. But that nation went too far and God said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step in on your behalf because the last thing God wants is you under the feet of an enemy. 
Now, if that don't encourage you, I can't encourage you to know everything after everything that sometimes we have done, and yet God says, I'm still not done with you. I can clean you up if you let me. If you'll turn to me, I'll turn to you. Praise God. If you... Yeah, I had to chastise you. I had to spank you. I had to discipline you. But thank God that you were chastised and disciplined because that means you're a son and not an illegitimate child. And I don't mean that ir- irreverently in any way. That's what the book of Hebrews says. If you can't receive the corrections of God, then you're not his son. Spiritually speaking, God will correct you and he'll discipline you. And sometimes he just, he just, you know, displeased. But the enemy wants you to feel like he's done with you. Say praise the Lord. What, what an awesome, encouraging word from God. And what exactly I said, get busy. Keep getting, keep serving God. Get busy. Don't sit on a church pew. Don't be dead. Get busy serving God. Get after it. Better days are coming. God is still with you. Nobody wants to help you, but God says, I'll help you. You feel like you're all by yourself, but God says, you're not by yourself. I'm with you. Get busy. Hallelujah. There's no, nobody on the earth like the church of the living God. Because you've got God, the life of God, in the midst of the church of the living God. And yes, we come short of the glory of God at times. But that doesn't mean that God's completely done with us. Because he's an amazing, amazing God. Be encouraged. There's better days coming. Hallelujah. Verse 16, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am re- returned to Jerusalem with mercies. Hallelujah. With mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Get busy. Get busy. My house will be built in it. Because I'm here by mercy. I'm here by grace. Say praise God. If you ever get to a place you should get cocky and prideful and arrogant, sitting on a pew, and not one to acknowledge that it's the grace and mercy of God that you and I are not consumed. We need God's mercy. We need God's grace. If we don't have it, we're consumed. That's why I'm going to keep praising Him. I'm going to take the garment, the filthy garments off. And I'm going to put, I'm going to choose to put on the garment of praise. I choose to worship Him. I choose to repent. So I will build. And obviously you know the temple, as I told you last week, the temple represents the church of the living God. God said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Doesn't matter what what people want to say. It doesn't matter the headlines they want to write. The, the, the church is, they say, well, say the church is done. It'll never argue with you. God said, no, 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 no. God said, I'm still in that church. I'm going to, I'm going to build that church. Say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, glory be to God. By his mercies. Verse 17, cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion and shall choose Jerusalem. Comfort my people. Encourage them. Said they're going to spread out all over the place. Growth everywhere. Hallelujah. It's not the end. Praise the Lord. That old negative mindset that gets a hold of us. We all have to fight negativity. Brother Dice used to say this to us. No, if you got, if you're a negative person, you never do anything. You can't be negative and ever do and, and, and do anything. Hallelujah. That old negative mindset gets a hold of everybody here. You got to get rid of that negativity and say, God is with me. God is merciful. I know I don't deserve it, but I'm still going to serve him. I'm going to be faithful. And God's going to build his church. And the gates of hell is not going to prevail against it. And I'm going to be a part of that church. Say praise the Lord. Sometimes you come short. You know what I'm saying? 
feel all down when you come to church. Don't even, don't feel worthy to even be there. But you better get here because God's in the midst of the church by mercy and by grace. He's promising a, a glorious future. Better days are coming. How many of y'all believe for better days to come? I'm not going to let the negative generation and my negative spirit get a hold of me. I'm believing for better days. Better days are coming. I told you I believe a revival is coming like the world has never seen. It may ultimately be in the tribulation period, but you haven't seen what God is going to do in the earth. It's not time to hang your head and be discouraged. There's better days coming. God is with me. And if I know that, I'll get busy. The Bible goes on and gives us the second vision and the third vision in verses 18, 19, and 20. Then lifted up my eyes and saw, behold, four horns. Who are these four horns? Horns in the Bible represent Gentile world powers. Daniel chapter 7 tells you that. And so Daniel sees these four horns, Gentile world powers. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament there were four horns on the altar of God. Those four horns rep represent the four corners of the earth. That altar was in Jerusalem. And God was offering repentance to the whole world, the four corners of the earth, from that altar in Jerusalem. Horns speak of power here in Gentile power. The Bible says, what is the purpose of these four horns? Well, historically, and also connected to the future, is we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome that afflicted the nation of Israel. Rome will come back in the form of ten nations in the end times and will grow from there under the Antichrist. So God said there will be four powers that will come and afflict my people. Are y'all here today? These four horns. And what is that purpose of these horns? They would scatter my people. But what was the purpose of them scattering the people of God? So that they would return back to Him. Hallelujah. Say praise God. Not to destroy them, but to just discipline them. Not to destroy them, but to bring them to repentance. God didn't want to destroy you. He will chastise you to bring you to repentance. He scattered them by these four powers. So the Bible said these horns, which was, these are the horns which scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Amen. Say praise the Lord. God said these four horns, these nations, they scattered Jerusalem. This was my wrecking crew. Oh, all right, all right, all right, all right, man. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. It doesn't take much to tear down something. You with me here? Let me tell you, and you don't have to be very smart to tear down something. You with me here today? You understand what I'm trying to get across to you? You don't have to be very smart to tear something down. But you have to be skilled to build something. And what, what God said, I'm going to use my wrecking crew, these four horns to go, and I'm going to clean the land. Clean it. And then once I clean it, then I'll build on it. Say what? Before God can build in your life, sometimes He got to send His wrecking crew to do to clean house. To, you know what I'm saying? You can't build on land that's not cleared off. If you try to build on land that's not cleared off, you're gonna have a problem. So God sends the wrecking crew. Man, He got to He got to remove some stuff that shouldn't be there, clean off the land, and then start building. These four powers were God's wrecking crew. Let me just say this to you again. It doesn't take a very smart person to destroy the church. There are people all day long that, that will try to destroy the work of God. Try to destroy the church. It don't take too much smarts to do that. But it takes some skill and some spirituality and dedication to build something. Amen? You watch and see some of these wrecking crews knocking down buildings. Man, within a week's time, they can level a huge building and put it on the trucks and haul it off. But it takes a long time and a lot of skill, blueprints, and all this to build something. It takes a long time to build something. But there's some people in the, in the, in the, so it's their church. They're in the church, but they don't build. They just tear everything up. 
And it doesn't take much of a person to tear everything up. There are people that people that tear families apart. Because it doesn't take much brains to tear a family apart. Tear a church apart. But you're going to build something, man. It takes skills, right? And so God says, after I send my wrecking crew and I level everything, it should be leveled. Get that out of the way. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now we can build. Now we can build. God said, we got to get some stuff out of the way first. Then we can build. And when we build this time, we're going to build it the right way. And so after this second vision of the horns, then he's, God shows him these carpenters. Now some people put carpenters in this vision. But that's why I say if you have the carpenters and the branch, then you have a total of ten instead of eight. But if you want to make it a part of this particular vision, then you would still be in the second vision. But I think maybe this is the third vision. So anyway, the Lord showed me four what? Carpenters. So after you have the wrecking crew, then you got the carpenters. And God said, I got my carpenters at work right now. Who are the carpenters? I got my prophets. I got my preachers. I got the priest. I got the people of God. I got some skilled laborers. The prophets, I'll tell you how, how to build. I got Zerubbabel, a governor, set order in the house. Not just a prophetic word of inspiration, but I got a Zerubbabel, a governor, to show you how, how to set the order in the house. Skilled laborers to know how to build the right way. Hallelujah. Brother Brandon sent me a picture the other day where they were sheetrocking. Man, they sheetrocked a huge building, right? You, and I thought to myself, man, the, the, the labor intensity that it took to put that sheetrock up, how, how hard that must have been, and, and the skill that had to be there to put that up there and then the tape and to bed it. You gotta have some skill to do that. You gotta have some strength to do that. Any, any old ignoramus can tear something up. God said, I got four carpenters. Then said, I what, what come these to do? I like his, his language. That's kind of the way I talk. What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them. The carpenters are come to fray him, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. I said, Now I'm, I'm building now. These carpenters are going to defeat this wrecking crew and build. Give God praise in the house. Please stand. Please stand. Lord, we thank you today. We're encouraged. Better days are coming. God, we know that you're with us, so we're going to get busy. We're going to worship you. We're going to praise you. We're going to pray. We're going to seek your face. Hallelujah. We receive from your hand the correction that we need to receive. We, we choose, Lord, to recognize the need in our own life for the wrecking crew to come and remove a lot of things and we need to remove the clothes as well in our lives that shouldn't be there but Lord that we know that you're there with us by your mercy and that you will build us the way we should be built because Lord you desire only good things for your people you desire the best for your people tell them the better days are coming encourage them in Jesus name we pray Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands and worship God? Don't let me be the only one talking now because you have an opportunity to worship God. Let words come out of your mouth to praise unto your King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I tell you, I tell you, brothers and sisters, there's going to be a temple built in the kingdom age. It's going to be built. Before it be, it's built, there's going to be a wrecking crew that comes in the form of 21 judgments the book of Revelation talks about. And Zechariah talks about and other prophets. But 21 specific judgments are going to come. And God's going to remove apostasy from off the earth. 
And when he gets through removing apostasy from the earth, then you'll have the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything that seeks to oppose his appearing will be removed. And when it is removed, that's when he will appear. And what God is busy doing right now is, and in the future he will, is he's getting things out of the way, obstacles out of the way that are hindering the appearing of Jesus. Before he comes back physically to this earth, you need to know it as a church. He's going to remove everything out of the church. Judgment will begin at the house of God. Everything that's hindering his appearance in the church is going to be removed. And then there will be a revelation or an apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Lift your hands and give him praise again. Give him glory that he might be seen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. And look at your neighbor and tell him better days are coming. Because that's the word of God. If I'll repent and I'll change and return to God, better days are coming. May the Lord bless you real good. How many of you know if there's better days coming, you'll get busy today? Man, if I, if I, if I tell you, if I tell you, it's always going to be this way, man. You know, you just like, I don't know if I can handle that, you know? But if I tell you better days are coming and God is with you, you will get busy serving Him. May the Lord bless you real good. Let me pray and we'll, we'll pray over the meal. Father, we stand in agreement together and we pray over this meal that we're about to eat together. we we'll ask your blessing to rest upon it. Lord, we thank you for the unity in the church. We thank you for your strength and power and presence. In your word today unto us, we hold on to it, God. And we thank you for it. Bless and nourish this food to our bodies, we pray. Heal us of all sickness and disease. And we thank you for loving us and dying for us and staying with us. And we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen and amen. All right, you're dismissed to go and eat. Uh, you'll go out again. You know where the dining hall is. And uh, you, if our, for our guests, please somebody invite them as well to go with you and show them where the dining hall is. All right. May the Lord bless you. Amen.